this evening with the voice of Victor Hugo, with narratives and letters pieced together to bring you an insight into this great work of art. It's 165 years since Victor Hugo penned his play Le Roi Samuse, which became La Maledizione Il Duca di Vendôme, and then eventually Rigoletto. When his play was first performed in 1832 to the audiences of Paris, it fell into disgrace. The opening night was also the closing night. <laughs> and despite the French constitution, which permitted freedom of expression, the play was banned and didn't see the light of day again for two decades. But the eventual triumph of Rigoletto was not, of course, as a play, but in the art form of opera, and composed by one of the true masters and colleague of the great Victor Hugo, his friend, Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi had already set Hugo's play Ernani with great success as an opera with revolutionary undertones. And he wrote to the poet Francesco Maria Piave of the Teatro La Fenice. He said, I have in mind another subject, if the police will allow it, destined to be one of the greatest creations of modern theatre with a character who will be one of the great creations that the theatre of all nations can boast. Indeed, he was right, a character which is relevant even today, that of Rigoletto. The Austrian censors, or the police, as Verdi used to call them, promptly bade the composer and the librettist to desist from their plan. And it was during this time that the play underwent its metamorphosis from the original Le Roi saint to Rigoletto. In the end, the changes were very slight. Paris became Mantua, the king was demoted to a duke, and Tribolet became Rigoletto. But the drama remained, and that was what counted for Verdi, and that was what had aroused his inspiration and made him fight. And it was during this fight that Verdi wrote a letter to the head of the Fenice protesting the modifications, and this letter is a lesson in Verdian dramaturgy. An excerpt reads... I see, finally, that you have avoided making Tribolet ugly and a hunchback. Why? A singing hunchback, someone may say. Well, why not? Will it be effective? I don't know. But if I don't know, neither does the person who proposed this change. I believe, in fact, that it would be very beautiful to depict this character externally deformed and ridiculous and inwardly full of passion and love. I chose this subject precisely for these qualities and these original features. And if they are removed, I cannot write the music. In short, an original and powerful drama has been turned into something quite cold and commonplace. Well, what, after all, was so objectionable about this story? Well, um, here, here the vicious libertine is anything but repellent. The misshapen jester is the embodiment of selfless paternal love, and even the sweet Gilda is not completely pure. She is tainted by vice, she forgives her seducer, and commits suicide to save him. All the characters are contradictory, unexpectedly against the grain. And when Rigoletto says, Pari siamo, he could be expressing the motto of the entire opera, the beautiful and the ugly can be equally good and evil. But to begin, the Duke of Mantua, a frivolous man in search of amorous adventures, his courtiers and their ladies are celebrating with a splendid feast. And for the time being, he is captivated by the Countess Ciprano. The court jester, Rigoletto, suggests to the Duke that he imprison Count Ciprano, which would make the Countess more receptive to his advances. The court and the courtiers are outraged and, and resolve to take vengeance on Rigoletto. The aged Monteroni bursts into the assembly and accuses the Duke of dishonoring his daughter. He denounces the ruler of Mantua and calls down on the mocking Rigoletto a father's curse. An affrighted Rigoletto cowers before this malediction. Now, in the second scene, Imagine, if you will, a deserted alley. Rigoletto is remembering Monteroni's curse when he stumbles upon evil in the guise of Sparafucile, an assassin for hire. 
He reminds Rigoletto of his services and wends his way. But Rigoletto's mind still dwells on this curse, a father's curse, a father to whom his daughter is the most precious gift. As he enters her lodgings, he nudges their dialogue into words of caution of going beyond their home and before leaving, charges her maid to guard over her. The Duke, in his quest to woo Gilda, emerges from the shadows exclaiming love for her, and their meeting, although it's brief, ends in an impassioned duet, Adio Speranza ed Anima. Farewell, my hope, my soul, farewell. Be aware of movement behind Gilda's gates. It's the nobles and the courtiers intent on seeking revenge. Rigoletto's beloved daughter is a secret that no one is privy to, and the courtiers believe her to be his mistress. At that moment, Rigoletto appears, and for once, he is the fool, and he is lulled into aiding the kidnapping of his own beloved daughter who will be born to the ducal palace. The ghastly deed done, Rigoletto is left alone with his daughter's scarf lying on the ground at his feet. He staggers under the weight of this disaster which, through his own connivance, has befallen him. Ah, la maledizione! He cries out. It is Monterone's curse. <coughs> Thank you. 
Oh! <laughs>
palace where we find a disconsolate duke. Having again returned to Rigoletto's house, he discovers it empty, believing that Gilda has flown. During his lament, his courtiers arrive to announce their successful capture of Rigoletto's supposed mistress, whom they have brought to his palace. Instantly cheered, he hastens to the chamber where she is she's being kept to console her in his own inimitable way. Feel the rage of Rigoletto as he storms into the palace, knowing that his beloved daughter is there. And it's this 
juxtaposition of fury and light-heartedness, which is astounding in the character. His emotions are vast as we see and hear the clown who jests while his heart is breaking. When he realizes that his hopes of having Gilda returned are slight, in a stirring lamentation, he pleads with the courtiers to return his daughter to him. Unexpectedly, she enters the room, her despair easily read. And father and daughter are alone within the grandeur of the palace and share Gilda's naive account of her encounters with the Duke, whom she believed to be a student. Rigoletto attempts to console her in a stirring duet. Piangi, fanciulla, weep, my child. And it's at this moment that he's again reminded of Monteroni's curse, as Monteroni himself is led through the palace to his execution for denouncing the duke. Rigoletto swears revenge upon Gilda's seducer in a final duet. Si vendetta, tremenda vendetta.
It's a dark night, the mist slowly rising from the Mintio River. The moon bravely battles to shine through the looming storm clouds. The road which leads along the river bank is deserted except for one lone, misshapen figure and his daughter. Out of the fog appears a dilapidated inn, the home of Sparafucile. Inside, Sparafucile and his beautiful sister Madalena are preparing and hoping for the unsuspecting travelers. In the distance, become aware of the Duke appearing in this place of ill repute, dressed as a soldier. Gilda starts upon seeing him when it becomes obvious that he is at this place to seduce the beautiful gypsy, Madalena. He sings his famous aria, La Donna Immobile, Fickle is Woman Fair. Madalena moves in, pretending to the Duke to be coy, whereupon the Duke becomes insistent in his demands. Gilda is desperate. <coughs> Rigoletto <coughs> smells vengeance. Sparrow Fugile receives payment from the hunchback for the assassination he's about to engage in. Confident that Gilda has seen enough, Rigoletto sends his, his daughter home dressed in male attire to guarantee her safety. The storm now gathers closer, lightning and thunder all around, and the wind whistles through the holes in the ancient building. Out of the shadows, drawn back like a magnet, emerges the familiar figure of Gilda. She has returned with a sense of foreboding. She overhears Madalena pleading with her brother for the faithless Duke's life, even suggesting that Rigoletto be murdered instead. However, there is honor even among assassins. Finally, relenting, Sparafucile agrees that if someone knocks on the tavern door before midnight, that they shall be murdered instead and given to the jester in a sack for him to dispose of in the river. Over the storm, a clock strikes the half hour. Gilda knocks at the door and enters. A bell tolls midnight and the hunchback returns. The storm is abating, the thunder is distant. Sparafucile brings out the sack for Rigoletto. This sack is his winding sheet, exclaims Rigoletto, as he drags the sack towards the river. Likely, upon the night, fall the notes of a familiar voice singing. It is the Duke of Mantua. Frantically, he tears open the sack to behold his precious daughter. Not quite dead, she's able to whisper, too much I loved him, now I die for him. As she dies, Rigoletto recognizes that Monteroni's curse has finally fallen on him. He utters the words, La Maledizione.
Scudi hai tu detto, ecco ne dieci, e dopo lo fai il resto. E qui rimane, sì, alla mezzanotte ritornerò. Non cale, a gettarlo nel fiume basta io solo. No, no, il votario stesso, sia il suo nome, vuoi sapere anche il mio.
Gilda, mia Gilda, 